they seem so present. They seem so modern in, in all the machinations and the, in the way they were all working each other. Well, the only reason to do anything historical or the only reason to do anything at all, write anything at all, is if it reflects the times we live in now. Mm -hmm. If the Muslims conquer Rome, will they turn St. Peter's into a mosque and change the city's name? No, Alexander. Well, 40 years ago, they renamed Constantinople Istanbul. And the Basilica of St. Sophia is now a mosque. I've seen you, I mean, I've literally seen you write in my, in <laughs> That's my right, library. in your house, yeah. In my house. Right. But I know you get up every day at like five. Yep. And, and you do, I know you do this um, like 10 months a year maybe, right? 11 months no, a year? No, the whole, every... But you take, I, uh, you take, oh, you take a month off from drinking. That's enough. Yeah. <laughs> you get up every morning at five and, and you write. You feel compelled yep. to write whether... Something. Yeah, something. Yep. And so you start, you, you write at five in the morning. And, and I write longhand. You write. You, you don't use. Don't use a computer. You don't use a computer, and like the, some of the the research. There's so I know you live literally live in a library, mm -hmm. and I jokingly say whenever we have a benefit at your house, there'd be like 300 people there, and I say a few words, whatever we're raising money for. I always say, and feel free to take any of these <laughs> books. That you, <laughs> well, you're one of the people I know that read every book in their library. <laughs> your series, uh, Borgia. To me, it was a history lesson. It was, uh, as I say, whoever the, forget the cinematographer's name, but you know, I mean, it looked fantastic. Yeah. It, the uh, the period, you felt it, you smelt it, you good, know. Good. The, yeah. the wardrobe, the clothes, the bill, everything. Yeah. I had the good fortune to have you come and visit us in France at our house and work on, and yeah. so I like to think I'm a little bit a part of it. Absolutely. Some of the wine we gave you helped write some of that title. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so, like, for instance, in Borgia... Here's the thing. It is the beginning of the Renaissance. Now, we always think of the Renaissance as the finished Renaissance. Michelangelo, no, Da Vinci... it was an evolutionary this process. Was the, this was the root of, the, of it. The Medici's were just coming along. Exactly. And, right. and in the same way that now we, we're living in this kind of, you know, uh, digital technological Renaissance, right. where... where the world we knew mm -hmm. is no longer. We right. we might as well have lived in the dark ages. It's unrecognizable. Yeah, from even from the eighties. Exactly. Yeah. And so and, and it, but if you think of if you think of the Borgia family as living, just at the at, in the nineties, yeah, the, like at year right. two thousand two thousand one. When the laptops first came out, or exactly. Something. That that's that's the that's what they were trying to figure out. So it wasn't finished. He perceived it that, that the world not, was changing. That the world was changing, and that he wanted to have his family's imprint on it. Right. Let's so, let's let's uh, let's see a clip from Borgia. All right. Shlomo, can you crack that up, please? Soon we will face more than a bar brawl. The Pope, riddled with fever, inches toward death. Keep your weapons ready, even at mass. Another fascinating thing is, you know, the Pope's, you know, the Pope's been married, they've got kids, you know, I mean, modern day, the Pope is this pristine guy with the fish hat and the red shoes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> banging whatever, yeah. but um, and th just I mean the the literal court intrigue mm -hmm. of the way the popes were trading lands and titles and I I mean I, that to me was so fascinating and and it's so like it's today that's what goes on yeah. except yeah. that you know they're under the guise of being of God but yeah. they're all politicians. Well, see all... the thing for me was I mean first of all I I I don't it's not meant to attack the Catholic Church no, because I, I do take, believe I didn't take it that in, way. in a lot of the values Some, of the Catholic yeah, I know. Church. But what what you say to yourself is uh, if you take out the the religion part of the Catholic Church and turn it into a brand the Vatican Inc. It's it it might as well be it's News a great Corp. Way. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's a great way to put uh, or, it. Or or any yeah. other major corporation. Right. Yeah. And so the the all they were selling, which is a much better thing to sell than newspapers. In their is, view, was is, salvation. W yeah, salvation, and, eternity. Right. So I, Rodrigo was so politically astute yeah. and and aware of what he was obsessed with. What people thought of. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
being an outsider, being a Catalan, but wanting to be, he said, uh, you know, I, I'm from Spain, but I'm a Roman. Exactly. Now, why, why did he, why, what compelled him to want to do that? Was it just his, his, his lust to be the Pope, or it seems more like he wanted to have his family in every country, you know, sleep and fuck every other royal family and well, and like, see, that, that's the thing is, was I he a Murdoch? I, I, I mean, well, like, that's that's what I think of. I think of him. You know, a lot Murdoch of people than talk. Corleone? I, I think he's more Murdoch than Corleone. I think he's uh, he's a guy who looks at the world that's available to him, and looks at the com competition, right, and says, "Well, fuck these guys. I can do better than them." You, you know. So you kill him or you marry him. <laughs> I mean, that's what they did in those days. Yeah, exactly. Now you can't kill them, so you disgrace them in the press or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. So he figured out that... He, he, well, he figured out that he could, if he, if he got into a place, that he could rise, and he, and he, and he had the patience to bide his time to, to, to go up the ladder. I found that the, the dialogue in that was, was so astounding because... It's obviously not the way people talk today, but it was conversational and it was poetic. And it was tricky coming was up amazing. with the right language, the balance of yeah. the language, because you didn't want it. I, I, I kept saying to the cast, it, it, it's not Shakespeare, it's Fontana. And if you try to make it sound like Shakespeare, yeah. It's going to sound like yeah, shit yeah, because yeah. I'm not Shakespeare. I, yeah. I mean, well, I'm not, I wish I was. That and neither good, was he. But that's another. <laughs> that's another show. Yeah. That, that. Um, so uh, the next pope to come in after Rodrigo was, was Della Rovere, who was Pope Julius II, and he's the like the Michelangelo guy. He had Michelangelo paint the Sistine right, Chapel. Right. Well, he hated Rodrigo so much, and the whole family never wanted there to be another Borgia pope again. Right. So he hired writers. Guys like me well, to make up stories wow. about the family. Now, some of them were based on little kernel of truth, and some of them ah. were totally made up. So the poor Borgia family. This is Orwellian almost. Yeah, no, it totally is. Well, it, and 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 it, it's like what they did to John Kerry. They took they took a right. piece of a story and boat. turned it into the into the most negative thing they could possibly come up with. So some historians took that to be fact, and it, those things got passed down. And so when I was going back to do the research, I was looking not only at the at the stuff that had been passed down, but I went back to original sources. See, that's what to I want to find. This stuff. How do you get these these conversations? You've been reading what diaries, uh, other uh, historians. Uh, uh, there, uh, yes, there there a, are diaries. So much work uh, involved. There's in a lot of work, but you know, it's fun. not labor. It's, it's not yeah, labor. It's, it's art. It's fun and. And but believe me, I'd probably be doing this kind of reading if anyway, nobody was yeah, paying me. Right. There were diaries of the period. There were a lot of what I found were uh, letters that the ambassador to the Vatican wrote to his boss, the Duke of Ferrara yeah, yeah, or the yeah, King yeah. of France. You actually found found the the, the letters, wow. you know. And and what you find that what's interesting about that, you'll have the same event, like let's say Lucrezia's wedding night. Depicted in two different several ways, different ways. Because one guy's writing to his boss who loves the Borgia right. family, and another guy's writing Yeah, those to assholes had a shitty them. wedding. What is yeah. the best wedding I ever saw? Best wedding I ever went to. Right. So, so what it allows the dramatist is a ch an opportunity to kind of find maybe, hopefully, a, 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 a deeper a truth. A semblance of the, right. Yeah. So uh, how, do you f how do you find what you can arrive at as this is what really happened. For me, you have to start with character. I mean, it's what we did on Homicide, it's what, it's what I did on Oz, and it's what I did with Borgia, which is you, you have to say, I have to know who these people are individually. And then once I've made those decisions, then I say, okay, now I think I know how he or she would act if this were the circumstances. When you're writing, do sometimes you find the character will then inhabit you and you continue a line and you don't know where it comes. I mean, I, I, that happens to me sometimes, not often, more. I wish it would happen. But I, I sense in you that you get into this, like a jazz musician, you're writing, you start with the, you know, the, the, the major chord, let's say, and then all of a sudden these solo and these things start, is that what happens? That, that, that is what happened, but see, it's also, what's wonderful about it is when you have actors that you enjoy working with and uh -huh. enjoy writing for, they actually become the, the inspiration. You hope. You, you hope, but I mean, I think most, you know, if you go back to the theater, most 
uh, playwrights, if you, if you look at Shakespeare, Moliere, the, the Greeks, they all worked with a company of actors on a regular basis. That they knew, right. Yeah, I mean, he wrote Hamlet That's a good for point. Burbage. He didn't write Hamlet for, geez, I hope I can cast this Yeah, part. yeah, I'm hip. Yeah. You know? Right. In Oz, you had a character um, in the wheelchair who Augustus was, Hill, you know, yes. the Greek chorus. Yes. Um, so you borrow things from antiquity. Steal. And, and, and I steal no, from everyone. No, geniuses borrow. Thieves oh. steal. Ah. You dignify your theft. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, you know, you're a genius, and you're paying homage to a form by having the Greek chorus in a modern-day drama about prisons. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who know me and know that I know you have wanted me to ask you, what, what was your fascination with the prison system, and, and uh -huh. Oz in particular, the way it was depicted? It came out of two things. One is when I was uh, young and living uh, up in Buffalo, there was the, uh, these uh, riots in Attica. And yes. they, you remember those? Yeah, I do. And uh, it, I remember at the time going, well, what could they be rioting How old about? Were you? Oh, God, I was probably... 16, something okay, like that, so, something like but, that. But uh, it was something you could have some perception of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was wondering, well, what are they, what are they writing? I yeah. mean, they're prisoners. They should yeah. be in prison. Yeah. What are they, conditions? What, are, what is their problem? And then when they got killed, when, the, when uh, Rockefeller when saw, sent in the, right. the, 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 the uh, National Guard and all that stuff, I was like, well, this is Something's fucked up wrong. too. So, right. And I always thought, well, what would happen if, uh, what happens to them? Because most TV shows, you know, CSI, whatever, the, you get the bad guy, he goes away at the end, and the next week, the cops are there. But yeah. you never know what happens to the, to the bad guy. Uh -huh. So my question to myself was, well, what happens to the bad guys? And I don't know if you remember, we did an episode of Homicide right. about a prison riot. Yes. And uh, that was in my head, my first kind uh. of like sketch of what a show about a prison might be like. Uh. Uh, and then off of that, I started to like really develop the idea fully. What and year did you leave, when, when did you leave Buffalo? To come I to? left in uh, 2011, no, uh, 1975. So in Buffalo in 1975, what was it like? It was on the uh, it was on the downslide, it was. and um, uh, but it wasn't uh, economically as in bad a shape as it is right now. And you had a Catholic education there. I did very much Jesuits uh, in high school. Yeah. So, and what about grammar school? Nuns. None. So yes. you were all none of them flew. None of them sang. <laughs> no flying. No singing. That, yeah. So f from the time you can remember. Catholicism was an aspect of your being. Absolutely. And has uh, helped shape your perception of the world and history and psychology. And um, I, I always think of myself as sort of a half-assed Catholic uh -huh. in the sense of that I'm a Catholic by uh, tradition, but right. not necessarily in right. everyday practice. I understand it. Uh, it's, it's what I, when people say, uh, uh, am I Jewish? I say, well, I'm a cultural Jew. Mm -hmm. which means I don't do the rituals and I don't... But, you know, when the Germans knock on the door, they go, oh, you're a culture Jew? We're not going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to kill me anyway. So, um, but, but what fascinates me is that... Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump around here a lot because okay. this is the nature of who you are. Your series, uh, Borgia. That's a Czech-German-French production. Yes. And so uh, there's a lot of elements here that are new in the world. Mm. In other words, how do you make TV now? I mean, there used to be three channels. Now you're going to three different countries to get financing. Yeah. You're doing a 12-hour project. Our entire business, as you well know, is having a nervous breakdown. Yes. And part of that is coming out of this... Uh, Alternative ways of, of seeing things. Of, of distributing content. Right. Uh, fortunately for you and I, they right. still need us, but we don't necessarily need networks right. anymore. Right, right. And so this Netflix deal uh, is kind of extraordinary it, it, because it's original content for them. They're not buying. It's the first time they've done this. Yeah, first time they've done it. And people can go on whenever they want right. and watch it. I don't know about you, but that's how my viewing has gotten to be. They, they have a right to show it first. Yes. And then at some point you can show it. On, on a cable network, right. and it is obviously showing in, in and 30, Europe. And 30 countries or something. 45, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm rhapsodic over what I learned, even if I didn't know you. And the thing that I'm going to get to is why the Borgias, metaphorically, uh, you know, analogously, they, they seem so um, 
present. They seemed so modern in, in all the machinations and the, and the way they were all working each other. Well, the, the only reason to do anything historical, or the only reason to do anything at all, write anything at all, is if it reflects the times we live in now. Mm -hmm. there, there's, no, there's no purpose in doing like a, just a hardcore uh, documentary right. if it doesn't somehow relate to us. You're working on something now which I find really fascinating. Uh, for BBC America, a series about a 19th century detective. Mm -hmm. And is it based on No, it's guy? only based on real circumstances. It's a, it's a cop show set in New York during the Civil War. So it's about only a you. Young, <laughs> it's about a young Irish guy who comes back from serving in the war. Which and, side? Uh, on the Union side. Yeah. And, he, you know, there's, there's great, it, it just got great life to it. Because you have these three levels. You have five points, which is truly slums. You have 23rd Street, which is the rich people. And then you have these farms up in Harlem. So you have this kind yeah. of like deep, these three different worlds. Again, it's what I'm always talking about in New York. There's, there's all these different universes yes. slamming into each other. Guys and dolls. Yeah. So that's going to be on BBC America. Where would you shoot something that could look like it was New York in 1864? We are going to build the whole village of Five Points really? on, on a soundstage up in Toronto. Wow. So um, I'll have to come up. Yeah, definitely. Can I walk by in a funny hat? They won't know it's me. Well, and we'll just somebody Gra go, Munch! Now, what if Munch's <laughs> great-grandfather was a cop? <laughs> a Yiddish guy. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you something. Stay away from them. They'll rob you. <laughs> it's, it's, I've been very hesitant to do another cop show since Homicide. Right. Because you don't want to, you know, everybody in television wants just another one of the same. Mm -hmm. And my attitude is, well, I want to keep, like, screwing around. So, um... So it's fun. <laughs>